Welcome to the Final Frontiers radio show, where we spotlight inspiring missionary endeavors around the globe. Stay tuned to hear how you can personally get involved helping the Lord's frontline soldiers effectively advance the gospel where it has never been preached before. Today we have a testimony from a national preacher talking to us from Cambodia. We have an American missionary discussing his time planting churches in Malawi, Africa. And at the end, we'll have a special song sung by young Christian orphans in the country of Myanmar. Hello, this is Joshua Martin, and today I have a phone call coming from Cambodia. I have Brother Seahawk on the line. I got to meet with him not too long ago. It's in the city of Phnom Penh. Got to see some of his ministries, got to see some of the preachers there and go around to some of the places, and I loved Cambodia. I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed meeting you, brother. Thank the Lord for that, and thank the Lord for the opportunity that I can share with you, my brothers and sisters in Christ, listening in the radios. I was wondering if you could tell our listeners out there today a little bit about your history, about when you accepted Christ. I know you had told us that your dad was very much opposed to it. You lived in a Buddhist family, and your dad said, no, it's the foreigner's God. Could you tell us about that period of your life? I got saved in 1996 when I rode a bicycle with my friend going to the middle school. And then on the way, halfway go to school, one of my friends, he told me about the Lord Jesus Christ. And I never heard about the name of the Lord Jesus Christ at all. Mm. So I raised in the Buddhist religions. So when my friend told me about the Lord Jesus Christ, I realized that I'm a sinner. And then my religion cannot save me from sin. So on that day, I decided to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as my personal and savior. Two weeks later, my father known that I'm a Christian. Yeah. Because... I want to show to my people and my village that I'm a Christian. I went to church, but he doesn't want me to become a Christian. He said to me, Jesus, it's not our God. Yeah. Jesus is the foreigner God. It is a God for the long-nosed people like American. Yeah, long-nosed European, people. <laughs> yeah, it's sharp-nosed people. You know? Sharp nose. And he really concerned and he gave me a warning. You stop going to church and you stop believing the Lord Jesus Christ. But in my mind, and my heart, I realized that Jesus Christ is the only one God that can save my life and that can change my life. So, mm. And he's the only one God that can forgive my sin. Even my father told me that because my father, he's very strong in the Buddhist religion. And he taught me a lot and my family a lot about Buddhist religion because my father, he's also a monk in the Buddhist religion before he got married with my mom. So... I love the Lord. I keep going to church every Sunday. I just keep going to church by secretly, but two months later, one day my father, he asked me to have him to repair the roof of my home because the roof have some leaching when the rain is coming, so there is water inside the home. So he need me to have. So I said, yes, that I will have him because there's no school on Sunday. So I have my father's in the morning, but the work has not done yet. So I need to have him more in the afternoon. Right. But Normally, I do have a service on Sunday at 2.30 in the afternoon. So after lunch, I began to think, which one is my priority? I need to go to church or I need to have my father's more. So later on, I got a idea that I said, Lord, it should be first. So I did not have my father in the afternoon. I went to church. So my father, he very angry and angry to me. After I came back from church to home, he told my mom prepare the thing that I have, like a pack up. Yes. And, and he put it in front of my home. When I get <laughs> home, I almost go in the house and then my father is standing at the door and then pointed to me. You are not my son anymore. Get the thing that you have and then go to live with your God. Because you are not my son anymore, you don't listen to me and you still go to church. You still believe Jesus. So... You know, I kneeled down before my father. I said, Father, please give me another chance. So please forgive me, please. I said to him many times, I thank the Lord. He's still pity on me. But mm. my father said, if you want to stay with me more, you stop going to church. So I did not reply him anything. But he told me again and again. Finally, he allowed me to stay. My mind and my heart, I love the Lord very much. Every Sunday when I went to church, I still go into church, but by secretly. It's just very hard for me. Secretly, but in a way, yeah. the good thing is this. The Word of God changed my life. And then from day to day, from week to week, my life was changing. And when my father, he sins, my life was changing. It seems like he 
a little bit open the door for me. He know that I went to church, so it is the time for me that I can pray a lot in my family so that everybody can hear the word of God. So I pray, and sometimes when I pray, my brother and sister, they said, you're crazy, you speak alone, where's your God? Because <laughs> everybody, they speak to the idol. Uh, my father just put a stone in the Buddhist state and give incense and everything. So when I pray, they said, you're crazy, where's your God? Sometimes they hit my head and they mock at me, they're laughing at me because... It seems like they are really, really uh, strong in Buddhists. But in a way, I keep praying and I got a lot of persecution in my home. It's about two and a half years. Hmm. But one day, my father, he asked me about the Lord Jesus Christ. And that day, thank the Lord, I able to tell my father of the Lord Jesus. Amen. And then my father, he said to me, son, I lost the way for many years. He realized that this only Jesus can forgive his sin and only the Lord Jesus Christ can give him the way to go to heaven. He said that his religion never taught like that. And then he said religion cannot guarantee going to heaven. So only Jesus. On that day, he received Christ as his personal Savior. So I praise God and yes. I'm really excited and jumping. I said, praise God for his answer. My father got saved. After that, my mom got saved. Mm. And after that, three of my brother got saved and my two sisters got saved so I praise God for his answer my prayer because I know my God is alive and he lived and that's why he answers <laughs> my prayers Amen. You know? it's a really fun to hear about how your own friend led you to Christ and then you grew up in this Buddhist family so you experienced all this persecution but it's really neat to hear how your father finally came to the Lord how he said he could see the truth he could see that he was on the wrong yes. path and that's what it is in Buddhism is being on a path on the way and and he saw that he was on the wrong one and then it was only Christ that could give him forgiveness of sins I wish I could speak to your father I never got to meet him but he sounds like a really neat guy I'm sure he went through a lot yeah, I thank the Lord for him. He's a very good preacher. He's always preached to the monk, uh, to the people that work in the Buddhist temple, you know, yes. it because he's a monk before and then he know a lot of Buddhist word and he can talk to them. So I thank the Lord that God chose him and I thank the Lord for him very much. And he also is supporting me a lot in the ministries. So, Amen. And God called me to full-time service in 1999. Okay. And I doesn't want to become a preacher that day. I said, Lord, I just want to be a businessman. I can help the church. So this is my goal because I don't want to be a preacher. But, you know, I could not sleep like three, four days. And then finally, I know that God called me to preach. So the end of 1999, I surrendered my life to be a preacher. I said to the Lord, Lord, there's no circumstances or what happened to me. I will give my life to you and then I will continue to serve you until the rest of my life. Right. So I enrolled in Bible college and I graduated 2003. But uh, life that served Jesus, I never thought that is, uh, you know, a lot of uh, story will be happening. <laughs> well, sometimes it's joy, sometimes it's really sad. But anyway, yeah, God, too. it's still good for me. And God is full of grace and mercy on me. So when I started Bible college, I ride bicycle from my church to the school about more than one hour. Just go there and then coming back, it's almost three hours. And then when I come back to church, I need to cook for myself. And then I slept on the full parts of the church five years. And five years so you slept years. on the floor? Yeah, because we just slept there. It's no mud because it's hot. But thank the Lord, almost every day we eat duck egg. The duck egg? Yeah. Yeah, duck egg. It is a favorite food that we have. You know why? It's cheap. <laughs> it's cheap and it's you got some food. protein, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's cheap food. But <laughs> but right now, I do pray for this walk with God, but I know that God is never forsake me, and He always fulfills His promise on me. You told me one time how the Lord built your faith and how you know He doesn't forsake you. You had said there was a time when you had no money and no food, and yet God provided after you were married. Yeah, one day my wife told me, husband, tomorrow there's no rice, you know. And then 
she's crying that time mm -hmm. because it seems like it's just finished in the evening already and then tomorrow we need to feed like more than 10 people in the church so how can we have the right for tomorrow so she's crying you know yeah and then i just said to my wife let us pray and then trust god that's uh, how god will supply what we need so my wife and i will pray to god almost one hour in that day and then we'll go to sleep and then very early in the morning like 5 30 in the morning my father he brought me one sack of rice in that day <laughs> I just said, wow, I didn't tell my father about that, but my father, he told me one sack of rice. So <laughs> my God is always supply what I need. Yeah, so God I knew. thank the Lord for that. Yes, God is a God that can provide and take care of me. So God is so good. Don't forget, pray for our preachers because I have a four places that I send my preachers so they really need help. Now, I know right now we're hoping at Final Frontiers for the applications for your preachers to see if we can give them a supplement and help them out. So we're looking forward to that. We're hoping that we can partner with you in that. Is there Amen. anything else that people can pray for you about right now? Please pray also for my family and I that the Lord will give us strength and more strength, more wisdom to do the ministries of the Lord in Cambodia. Yes. And then I'm really thankful for you that uh, you are really concerned. Van Frontier is really concerned about the loss of people. I really appreciate it very much. Yes. Well, we hope that we can partner with you more. And we're excited about what you're doing there. We are. That's wonderful. Okay, God bless you. God bless you, sir. Yeah, <laughs> bye-bye. Bye. Hello, my name is Mike Sandiford, and it's time for one of our original segments, Following Timothy. Following Timothy takes us around the world to hear the testimonies of our sponsored national trainees. Each of these men are currently being trained by veteran national pastors. What's their calling? To become church planners, to reach their communities, countries, and regions with the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you would like to know more about the Timothy Project, you can visit us at finalfrontiers.world. Today we take you to the country of India in the southern state of Karnataka, where the capital city of Bangalore is one of the fastest growing cities in India. The capital of Bangalore is also the city that Final Frontiers sent 50,000 clean heart tracks to the pastors and Timothys within that region. In his own words, one Timothy writes, I was born to a Hindu family, but personally, I was an atheist. I was also suffering from ill health, and due to a fierce disease, I experienced the deathbed. A brother from a church came to visit me and shared the love of Christ, and he prayed for me earnestly. After that prayer, I experienced peace in my heart. I called on the Lord Jesus to save me, and this was the first time that I had called upon the Lord. Over the next few months, we continued to pray, and gradually, I was healed in the name of Jesus. After a few months, I attended the church, and as the days passed by, my desire to serve Him grew. Currently, I am in training to be in the ministry. Please keep this Timothy in your prayers and others like him in the Hindu country of India. Every month, we consistently have several Timothy applications coming in. If you would like to know more about the Timothy Project and supporting the Timothy Project, you can visit us at finalfrontiers.world. Paul discipled young men like Timothy and Titus who journeyed with him and were given hands-on experience in church planting. And today there are many surrendered Timothys eager to receive training from national preachers and institutes, but lacking the simple finances for curriculum, living needs, and transportation to unreached villages. To make an eternal investment in a young church planner's life, visit finalfrontiers.org. This is Joshua Martin, and I'm here in Missouri with Pastor Matt Stallman. He was a missionary in Malawi, Africa, and we wanted to talk about that today, just kind of reminisce what it was like going to the field. Brother, can you tell us what it was like originally just stepping into Malawi, Africa? Well, f from the very beginning, I, I fell in love with Africa. Uh -huh. um, I would sit in church and hear missionaries talk about different places in the world and show pictures, and it was one of those things I always knew I would go somewhere one day, Mm -hmm. And I didn't know where or when. And uh, a missionary had come through our church, and he was presenting Malawi. And I was on the edge of my seat. And by the end of the service, I had found a place alone with God. And, and God was just really dealing with me on this. And, and you know, we were newly married, and we had two little kids. Um, I worked for the church there, Fort Dodge, Iowa. And so, I mean, things were going well. But there was just something in me that was always drawn to, you know, something different. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, so we surrendered that night, and it was a, it was a strange thing because I thought my pastor would be like, you know, no, <laughs> you know, slow down, you're not ready. I approached him, and and uh, he kind of gave me a green light. 
I was using that as kind of a, you know, maybe this will stop me. And it didn't. So we started deputation immediately. And so this whole thing was going, it was going really fast. And uh, in fact, it went so fast that the missionary who had presented Malawi that I was wanting to work with was an older man, a veteran. He actually ended up getting the field after we did. So we was actually on the mission <laughs> field first. After preaching for, for years, you know, children's church, nursing homes, street preaching, running different facets of the ministry here in America, I got mm-hmm. to Africa and I really had no idea what to do. Yeah. I, I had no uh, church planting, you know, concept as far as something systematic. So we just started preaching and that's all I knew to do is preach on street corners and hand out tracts and uh, the reception was overwhelming. People would stay in here preaching. And just just that right there, the fact that people would listen to preaching. If you've been preaching here in the States very long, you know that's 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 not a normal thing here. People will They don't take tracks as much no. either. Yeah. People will drive by, they'll shout something at you. Yeah. Occasionally somebody will stay. Uh, somebody will get saved. But in Africa it was it was exciting. That excitement wore off though. Um you know, as as you you preach and you realize that not everyone is as sincere as you think they are, mm-hmm. I found that a lot of older missionaries they can go one of two ways: they can be very tender, or they can be very hard and cynical. Mm-hmm. Because you you do have to sift through all of the response to the gospel because it's not all sincere. Sure. And so that first few months we were dealing with that sifting through that. Uh, I could go to in a village and preach, and hundreds of people could come. And uh, we really begin to see right away that not all of that was real. And month after month, we we sifted through people, or they sifted through us. I'm not sure how it worked, but uh, a lot of people took advantage of us. We caught up in a lot of different things that we shouldn't have been caught up in. We, we made all the classic mistakes that missionaries make. So those first few months were very difficult. I can remember being at Harvest Baptist Church and being in some college courses and Pastor uh, Marvin showing us like video that you had sent in. <laughs> I get to see services and everything and see the culture so very different. Wasn't there a story where you were preaching one time through the translator oh. and it was a totally different word that got used? <clears throat> yeah. I preached a message on buy the truth and sell it not. Yeah. And so the word that I was using for buy, apparently my translator was using the word dog. And so <laughs> the entire message came out to be dog the truth. <laughs> and sell it not. And uh, I had a few people afterwards who spoke English. They came up to me and they asked me what that was supposed to mean, dog the truth. <laughs> and that that was just, oh, that was one of so many. I preached an entire message on, on the sword of the Lord out, out of Ephesians 6, you know, the the sword of the Spirit. And uh, my interpreter came up to me afterwards. He said, Pastor, that was a good message. He said, I have one question. What is a sword? <laughs> After the entire message was preached. So... You know, if I could just say some things, first of all, not every convert is sincere. Mm-hmm. And it's so hard for me because by nature, I'm an optimist. I'm a positive person. It's so hard for me, but not every convert is sincere. In fact, we were robbed on multiple occasions by our own church members. And then translators, even though they might be good hearted, will never really convey the message that you're wanting to get. You're going to have to dive into the language. You're yeah. going to have to become a student of the language. And and I think that's something that, as Americans, maybe our pride, you know, we speak English, we have the King James Bible. I think that maybe has interfered with us. Mm-hmm. Um, most missionaries from the rest of the world would immediately expect to land on the ground somewhere and learn a language to be able to communicate. And so I, I would say, first off, make it a priority to learn language. Yeah. Very important. So what was it like having your family there, trying to protect your family, take care of your family? Were there any situations that were difficult? Well, yeah, the uh, the security was worse than we were told. Uh, again, we went sort of naive. We went sort of fast. Mm-hmm. And when we got there, we found that, that, that security was terrible. Uh, if you turned your back, everything was gone. And so that sort of theft was a nuisance. But it was an indication of there's a lot greater dangers out there, too. So we had times where vehicles were stolen. Mm -hmm. Uh, We had times where groceries would be stolen out of the vehicle. Windows would be busted. But we came down to, like, at at our home, when we would sleep at night, there was at least three or four instances where our home was uh, attacked in the night where either people tried to sneak in or just tried to boldly, you know, come through the doors. Growing up, I I guess I can say I kind of grew up sheltered. I hate to use that word. 
Mm-hmm. But in that sense, in the security sense, I did. Because we had never had those sorts of things at our home. We were raised in the country. We never locked our doors, left yeah. the keys in the car. It was it was really an eye-opener because I had to deal with that fact that, that tonight my family could be executed in our, in our own house. And if you're not careful, we can enter a point of paranoia. And, and I, I've seen that in Africa. I experienced that not so much in myself, but in some of the other missionaries who were there that had literally locked themselves away. Yeah, that can really break some people. Oh, it can. And it, it destroys the ministry and the testimony of the Lord. And so we struggle with the balance of trying to serve the Lord in, in difficult places of the world and protect our family. You know, we have scripture commanding us to do both these things. Mm. We're commanded to go. And at the same time, you know, I have a great obligation to my family. And so to make a plan and put a plan in action to be able to provide security and at the same time, in, in some sense, push the limits of, of places my family was going and things we were doing. We did sometimes cross those lines where we knew that God would have to protect us here. Uh, I remember a time in the Shiri River in Malawi when we looked out with two little kids in a boat. And my wife looked to the side and, and there was at least 100 crocodiles. I have video of this. <laughs> There's 100 crocodiles. They're just all around us. And I remember the boat captain looked at us and he said, if you drop something, let it go. <laughs> Do not reach <laughs> over the boat. Good advice. <laughs> and my wife just looked at me and gave me that look like, what are we doing here? You know, if one of these kids leans over this boat, they're going to be gone. Yeah. So it's a, it's a strange balance because you cannot stop. You must go up the river. You must go over the mountain and you must live in a place that's dangerous. On the other hand, you must stop and take inventory and look at the resources you have and how to protect them. Mm -hmm. I would say security and then just the relationship with me and my wife. Those were two things that that was a constant battle. There was almost a separation between us because we were so busy. There's so many things to do in the ministry and so many needs that we found ourselves separated even more than we were in the States, you know, at least in in the the bulk of our time Mm -hmm. as she was home because there was places that she just could not physically make it. Uh, yeah. the distant villages and things that uh, she could find herself easily being feel, a, feeling neglected. As a man, you have to be sensitive to that with your wife too. Right. Because it, it, it almost could put her in a position where that uh, she was not a part of the ministry. Mm-hmm. She was not really taking part. She was just on, on the sidelines. She was there just to, you know, to make sure there was food prepared. And it takes a lot of forethought to try to work through that and, and communication to make sure that the Lord is using your family properly in that place. So that's kind of a couple things right there that you could give as advice to young men that are planning on taking a family to a foreign country. Yeah, those conversations, just like any any young couple, those conversations about finance and about roles, where you can go and where you can't go, what days you're going to work, what days you're not going to work, when you're going to be home, uh, stuff that my wife and I, we, we'd never even contemplated we would be discussing on the mission field. Yeah. Now, when you left, you had uh, trained a national man. Was it? It was a short period of time because you had to leave because of uh, malaria and all that. But you did leave a church there. Well, the Lord was was very gracious to us. We had two churches. One was fairly well established, and and then one was was younger. But uh, one of the men was already saved. Lawyer Kanoa. He had known the Lord for a while, and I found him and had continued to disciple him. And then there was another man I, I found and, and led him to the Lord and, and begin to disciple him. And and I can't say that at the end of the, that year, those two churches were well established, but they were rooted. Mm-hmm. They were doctrinally sound. And, and when I left, there was another missionary who who continued to check in on those churches. But uh, that was two thousand and one when we left, and uh, I hear from both those pastors still. That's and both awesome. those both those churches are still working. Praise the Lord so for that. Yeah. It's exciting. Yeah, God used you even in that short amount of time and through all that suffering. Yeah, with malaria and all that, almost losing children to that in your right. life. Right, and, and I think God God orchestrated that. I, I had a difficult time for years understanding why God brought us home. And, and in fact, for years, I wouldn't even say God brought us home. I would just say that I, I couldn't make it or I didn't make it. But now, in hindsight, it's easy to see why God orchestrated that and God allowed us to be back here to be able to minister to younger missionaries. Right. Brother Matt, it's been good oh. talking to you today. All right, man. I appreciate <laughs> you having us in here. Yeah. Thank you very much, brother. <laughs> Your inquiries and comments are important to us. If you have questions or perhaps subject matter you would like to have addressed on the show, 
please visit finalfrontiers.world. Some teach that spiritual maturity should precede evangelism and church planting. They teach that a new congregation should not start others until they themselves are mature in the faith. The question is, at what point are any of us fully matured? The New Testament speaks of us coming to spiritual maturity only when we are finally in the presence of God. For now, any step along that journey is just that, a step, not an arrival. Others believe that when one accepts Christ, he is capable and should share his conversion with friends, family, and even strangers in the hope of bringing them to Christ. Not to spiritual maturity, but to a full saving faith in Christ alone and no longer in their gods, idols, or good works. The first believe that you cannot witness and plant churches at all until you know all there is to know. The second believe that a seed planted in fertile soil will grow and produce fruit, whether it was planted by an agriculturalist with a PhD, a dirt farmer, or a robot. The commission of Christ was to cover the earth with the knowledge of his glory and gospel. This spiritual seed, when dispersed, will bring forth fruit, more fruit, much fruit, and fruit that remains as the Lord prayed in his final hours. The idea that evangelizing and church planning must be led to the educated and ordained few has for centuries hampered the growth and the spread of Christianity. Paul was a learned man, but still a tent maker by profession, a man who persecuted Christians and could have been among those who condemned Christ. But after conversion, he immediately and continually preached in Damascus and was responsible for the spontaneous growth of Christianity. James, John, Peter, Matthew, and all the others who had lived with Christ for years personally witnessed all he had done and had heard all he taught were nonetheless happy for a time to remain at home in Jerusalem rather than to go into all the world as commanded. Perhaps they, like us, living in a city with thousands of Christians, still saw Jerusalem as a mission field rather than as a ministry field. Thank God Paul was not among them. I'm John Nelms. To learn more about missions, order a copy of my book, The Great Omission, on our website at finalfrontiers.world. The following is a song we recorded just over the border from Thailand in Myanmar. It's from an orphanage of 36 children singing their hearts out in the Burmese language as unto the Lord. We hope you enjoy it. Wait, wait, wait. 
You've been listening to the Final Frontiers radio show, funded by sponsors like you. Thank you so much for joining us. Through the funding of national and native preachers, we endeavor to effectively advance the gospel where it has never been preached before. If you want more information, visit www.finalfrontiers.world. That's finalfrontiers.world.